So what you see here is Hartford City Hall, the interior of Hartford City Hall. It's illuminated not only by the small lights, but also this huge uh, skylight uh, where you'll see spotty sun coming in today. Um, I think it's the perfect uh, scenario to kick off my exposure and negative design component of my power process. So what we're going to see here is a light and airy building that our eye brain perceives the building to be. But in reality, the film doesn't see it that way. The film sees very dark pockets of, um, of shadow and very bright highlights. So what we have to do is we have to employ an exposure and development technique that will compress a tremendous amount of contrast. And I think this particular scene is a perfect scenario to accomplish that. So we're here where the camera is all set up and focused, composed. We're going to talk a little bit about how I'm going to design the negative to accomplish, um, to come away with a negative with a light and airy feeling like our eye brain perceives this building to be. So right, right there is a good illustration of, uh, you know, you need all this, the power of development and exposure and whatnot to be creative. Well, in this sense, you need the, the power of exposure and development just to replicate the building as it looks because film does not see the same way um, that our eye brain does. And more importantly, the paper sees even less than the film sees. So you really need to think like the, your end process. And in my case, it's silver gelatin. That's not a big expanse of uh, gray tonalities. So my negative design in general, wherever I am, is I want to put a lot of bottom end exposure, but I compress, I, I make sure the highlights don't run away on me. That's the important component of my power process, negative design. So what you see here behind me is there's three archways. And I've, took, I've already taken meter readings in the back. And the shadow values I'm, I want to place on zone four. Well, you've heard me talk, or you will continue to hear me talk about putting shadow values up on the straight line. Zone four is considered to be the beginning of the straight line. So, it's not unheard of for me to put shadow values on zone five. It all depends on where the highlight falls. That really, and that goes against traditional wisdom as to, to how you expose a piece of film considering where the highlights are. Usually the highlights dictate the development and they still do in my process. But I'm not at all afraid to put a highlight up on zone 12 or zone 13 because I know I can pull it back to a printable range. And what that allows me to do, it allows me to put a lot of bottom end tonality up on the straight line, and it all gets compacted and compressed in the development and in the exposure and the development of that particular piece of film. What ends up happening in the dark room is because of multi-contrast papers, they've completely allowed me to, to design negatives much differently than, than I would have 20 years ago where you had graded papers and you had to be, adhere to a much more regi regimented um, palette of gray tones. You can almost think of my process in some, in some way, shape, or form as an HDR process in that I'm putting a tremendous amount of information on the bottom end of the, um, um, neg the exposure onto the negative and then I'm compressing it through film development. I'm not allowing the highlights to go up as high as they want to. So that pays dividends in the fact that I can now use a smaller amount of green light or zero filtration in the printing process. That's very, very important to my process. When you use less green light, you get to use more blue light. Now, some people might say, well, suppose the, the negative is too contrasty. Well, the way multi-contrast papers work is the green exposure or the zero filtration never really makes a dark gray tone. So if the negative is too contrasty, but still has information in the bottom end, tonalities and, and shapes, shapes and shadows, you just add a little bit more green light to your exposure to take away that edgy contrast that some of you may not like. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act, yes, but Without the information on the negative, you cannot have the flexibility that I have. And at the end of this segment, I'm going to walk over to that side of the, um, to the atrium, and I'm going to point out some things that will benefit from 
a smaller amount of green light. So what I want to do now is um, talk about these three arches. Um, unfortunately, we had a little bit of a malfunction with the microphone and the audio. So I'm actually doing a voice over in front of my computer, um, trying to replicate the thoughts that I was sharing with you folks uh, during the video. And what I'm talking about here in, in the video is um, the actual highlights and the density of the brightest part of the scene, which is the block, the granite block. If I let that highlight density go up to, uh, you know, 1.25, 1.3, where traditional wisdom would tell you, then I'm not going to be able to use as much blue light as I would like. So this is a great example where I keep the highlight density diminished and low. I'm able to use a little bit more green, a blue light, which is going to accentuate the mortar and the, uh, the separation between where the blocks are joined together. And while maybe that isn't that significant a gain, uh, when you shift over to the middle um, archway, when there's a deep, dark, shadowed um, doorway, what happens is you've already heard me say that there's going to be increased exposure with this particular negative. So that's going to put those tonalities a little bit higher up on the straight line. And if I keep the highlight density um, compressed, then I'm going to be able to use more blue light in the actual printing. What is the blue light going to do? The blue light is going to separate the shadows better than a negative that required a lot of green light just to get the highlights into uh, balance. And in the last uh, archway, there's, there's a, a beautiful set of receding arches that are a little difficult to see in the video, but uh, there's a, this layering effect of, of receding archways. It's just wonderful. In fact, I've actually made a photograph of just that archway for that very reason. Well, what happens when you keep highlight densities low you're able to use more blue light, which is going to accentuate and separate those archways to a greater degree than if you had to, than if your negative required a lot of green light. So not only does it pay benefits uh, up and down the whole tonal scale of the negative, it allows flexibility. And, and you've seen in either a previous video where I've actually printed this archway three different ways and that is a direct result of the lower contrast highlight in each negative. So uh, the reduced highlight density not only does it pay dividends in, in higher mid-tone contrast, it also pays dividends in the, um, the flexibility that your negative and ultimately the final print has as an option. Let's get on with um, actually making an exposure here. I've already metered this um, one thing that's important with this type of um, exposure, because it's going to be um, heavily minus developed, I've set the ISO at 64. Then I put my shadows on zone 4. That brings the, the sunlit facade that's in front of you up to about zone 11. That's essentially an N minus 3 development, which I do an awful lot of that type of development in this building. So I'm very familiar with those, those types of relationships. Um, continue. So I just want to detail a, a scenario here that is a little bit difficult to explain because traditional wisdom would tell you if you come in, if you encounter a contrasty situation, you can always use a lower contrast paper. I'm going back to my graded paper days. Um, that's true in, in the broadest sense of the explanation, but what you forsake when you use a softer contrast paper is you forsake a micro, a micro contrast, a sense of tactility within the shadows, if you will. So if, if my negative design is such that I'm not allowing the highlights to go very high on the density scale, then I, I have the luxury of not having to use very much green exposure or zero filtration. That allows me to use more hard contrast or five filtration. And where that pays dividends is in the mid-tone contrast. The mid-tone contrast is heightened and that's what people react with when they look at my prints. They're not quite sure why they react, but it is because of this mid-tone. It's an exaggerated mid-tone contrast. There's no question about it. It's exaggerated. 
but that's because of the way I designed the negative to be extremely flat. Had a workshop student come in just last weekend, and he, it's amazing how many nice quotes and, and phrases I get from workshop students. This fella said, your negatives are disturbingly flat. I took that as a compliment because so many people come in for these one-on-one -on -one workshops and they've never seen negatives that look like mine, much less they've never seen the prints that come away from my negatives. One fellow uh, came from South America and he said to me, if I didn't see you print that negative, I would have never believed that it was a capable of that kind of contrast. And that is because my negatives are so flat, I need very little amount of green exposure. And as I said earlier in the, in the, uh, in the segment here, um, if, if for whatever reason your aesthetic isn't the same as mine is in the midtones, you, you can just use a little bit more green light. You're not going to hurt the deep dark values at all. You're just going to take away that edge contrast that my prints tend to have. And the one final thing I'll say about um, my negative design is very basically uh, there are the photographers that have been doing uh, contrast masks for years and years and years. That's essentially what minimal agitation does, is it provides a tactility to the, the minor transition from, from dissimilar tonalities to be heightened. The difference between my process and contrast masking or unsharp masking in, in Photoshop is my process is organic. And people that have been uh, familiar with uh, digital negatives and such, they say that my prints have a, have, have a smoothness that digital negatives cannot produce. And while I'm not very versed in contrast masking, I can assume that there may be a little bit of uh, benefit to the organic nature of the way I process film. So I'm just doing, going through a final check of the exposures and uh, the development that I'm gonna call for. And uh, what I'm going to do is um, the shadow values are up on zone four. The highlight moved up to a, essentially zone 11, 11 and a, and a third. So what I'm going to do is an N minus three development. Um, that's going to call for an exposure of F22 at 15 seconds. Reciprocity tells me to go to 29 seconds. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do two sheets of film F22 at um, 29 seconds. Close the lens down a couple of times to make sure that everything is working. We're on T, we'll set the uh, lens to F22. We're gonna pull the dark slide. I'll get out my only digital uh, tool that I use and I go to the photography folder and I get the timer and I start the stopwatch for 29 seconds. As I say this is going to be a, an N minus um, 3 development. I'm going to do two sheets. The first sheet being the, um, the test sheet, so to speak. I want to get that, uh, that development dialed right in exactly. My target is um, uh, 1.0 above film base plus fog. Some of the benefits of my videos are going to be the wisdom that I'm going to pass on. Not so much the theory and concept, but the actual wisdom that I've learned over the years. And one of the things that I can highlight right here and now is the film holder that I've used for this very first shot of the day is the lowest numbered holder in my backpack. I always start with the odd number first. So the, in this case, it's the holder that I have is 11 and 12. I expose number 11 first, I expose number 12 first. If there's nothing that happens in, this, in the scene that tells me that I should develop number 12 first, I'll always develop the odd number first. That helps me because sometimes I forget to write things down, especially when there's a group around, such as, such as today, we're filming and whatnot. It's conceivable that I could go home without making actual uh, microphone notes on this particular holder. But I'll, I'll know that it's number 11 and 12 was the first holder that I did for the day. That's very important 
these are little tips of wisdom that I think are very valuable and I've learned over a lifetime of photography.